Today's video, we're going to be looking at some of the poets and other writers that you're currently working with. We're going to prove this is how volume D looks. Um, if you go to the modules, uh, you'll see that it was all jumped the way it's supposed to. And actually, it's not. Um, you'll see that um, in the course schedule, we have moved uh, into uh, the week 7 through 11 aspect of volume D material. You uh, hopefully read these uh, poets, uh, Amy Masters, Lee Robinson, Amy Lowell, uh, Gertrude Stein's little commentary about the making of Americans. And then we're looking at more poets with Frost, Sandberg, Seasons, Pound, and Williams. And you do have some study questions that are due coming up due by Sunday evening. Um, I want to go over some of those. This is what volume D looks like. Um, again, I apologize for not having the page numbers. They have multiple pages for these writers. As you can see, uh, uh, starts here with the introduction uh, about uh, these authors. We're going to look very quickly at these. Um, where again, you just have a little detail here, uh, and they talk about the, between the two wars as you're reaching the. Uh, Changes from World War One into World War Two. Um, talk about the, uh, Dr. Williams, the Carlos Williams, who was a general practitioner, um, and uh, this is what he wrote. As it says here, speeding fire truck. Uh, this is basically how modern uh, poetry begins looking at working with and details here. And Williams um, is one of those who's just really strong with what he did, the idea about imagism, part of what he was in, but he goes beyond just that. But Ezra Pound, one of the authors you're also asked to look at, was very influential with, with uh, imagism, the idea about one powerful surprising image, both in what is written, the wording of the of the, the poem, as well as sometimes even the appearance of the poem. It's supposed to be working with that one. So this leads us into American modernism. Uh, next, this is the era of modernism, and then after we get past World War II, you enter what is called postmodernism. Uh, and so you, you have those details, and it gives you some background here of these details uh, for those. And again, several background images for you that what was taking place, this idea about changes occurring, political, social life, women, role in society changing. We've already talked a little bit about that uh, in the previous um, uh, readings, such as. Uh, Maggie and um, Edith Pontellier, uh, The Awakening, and especially, of course, Daisy Miller, sort of the embodiment of the spirit of the American woman, the younger, younger American woman. You start having changes in development of writings. You have other uh, political uh, movements. The NAACP is founded during this time, 1909. You have the 19th Amendment passed in 1920, where women are given the right to vote. You have other aspects that are going to start developing and, and, and push through. Um, you'll see the writers who are looking at the expatriate life. Gertrude Stein, uh, The Making of Americans, her writing um, moves into, uh, moves over to, to France and stays there. You have others such as T.S. Eliot, um, who born in America, grows up in America, but moves to uh, England, takes British citizenship. Henry James did the same thing. We know about him. Uh, Ezra Pound goes and lives in Europe for quite some time. Uh, others, such as Hemingway Fitzgerald, are moving through uh, Europe and eventually do come back. There's other changes taking place, the movement from the south to the north, uh, as it's called the Great Migration. Um, you have changes economically, Great Depression is in this era, and that changes the number of issues. Uh, just move those off. Um, and so you have the literature that's going to start reflecting this with modernism coming in, uh, challenging traditional authority, looking at views, not only in literature, but in other areas as well. And so um, Fitzgerald looks at civilization and calls it a valley of ashes. Um, and so you have a number of issues that are brought in here. You have a reassessment of what's taking place. You have the rise of a number of buyers who are looking at and questioning um, the relevancy of what had been accepted. Uh, for the current times that they were in. You have the changes in other attitudes and views, excuse me for that popping up. Current uh, changes in views, such as 
with um, the uh, political and social environments. Uh, the Harlem Renaissance uh, occurs during this time. You have the changes in um, in those areas, but also the literature that starts changing. Um, choice of topics, choice of subjects, form, uh, presentation, all that becomes part of what we see. Um, so as we move through here, we see, as it says here, changing times and transforming people, and you can read through that. Um, but part of it stems from psychological studies that are starting to come through. Uh, with Freud, and then later with uh, with Jung, and his view of the collective unconscious, uh, collective unconscious that's being utilized, the rise of the middle class, double standards uh, being presented and offered. Uh, again, uh, a number of areas are presented. We talked about Du Bois, as I like to pronounce Du Bois, um, and what he looked at the idea of the views there. Uh, as Du Bois offers a commentary on the need to, to push change as opposed to um, uh, Booker T. Washington's uh, view about accepting and then showing how change can, uh, can be fulfilled. Again, here's how the, the pages are offered. It's very confusing when you look at this, which is why I did put page numbers for you. Uh, but we start having political changes. Uh, they list only Karl Marx actually co-written by Frederick Engel, who's where it gets lost here, but uh, Engels and Marx present the Communist Manifesto and the view about individualism pushing forward, uh, the idea of, of people sharing and developing, and of course reactions against that that occurs. And then you have, of course, uh, uh, lines that are going to take place in this era. Revolutions are taking place a number of, of ways in the media and science technology. Well, those revolutions are going to be presented in the in the literature as well, both as themes uh, and subject matters, but also just in style. All that occurs. Um, the uh, details that are offered down there. I'm going to go to this particular one about uh, Zora Neale Hurston, um, trained with an anthropologist, so that she gets to see how the world is in a different way, and her writing reflects that. Gertrude Stein um, in uh, Neuroanatomy, uh, Anatomy, Neuroanatomy, I'll get the right pronunciation here. I'll go for anatomical, but uh, uh, anyway, we have these. You have others who look at you know, science and the view. As all this takes place, you start seeing changes. You start seeing the development of uh, uh, a whole uh, genre of writing that, that draws on this. Um, Great Depression, of course, caused a number of issues and reassessment of what should be prioritized, what should not. Um, again, I'm just flipping through this very quickly. And we start moving from realism, which was in the 1840s and 50s, uh, and, and the naturalism. Um, uh, we talked you know, that Stephen Crane trying to show the, the naturalistic attitude that man is at the mercies, if you will, of natural forces, that, that man cannot change the world, that man is just part of it, and it's subject then to what nature wants to do, hence naturalism. Uh, where well, do you start seeing a change? Modernism coming in, uh, viewing the world in a different way. Uh, as it says here, this uh, The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, um, a work that, uh, as it says, represents the modern world in this plummet, ruin, and loss. Heap of broken images, it's really a strong work. Uh, Elliot there offered a comment uh, where he is trying to resolve this and looking to see how it works through, and you'll, you can see that uh, in, in his work. You have others uh, writing elsewhere, Nietzsche and Zola, um, then you have Norris and Dreiser and Crane, and we talked about Crane a bit, uh, who come in and look at their details and their views. Henry James, who's writing earlier and later, uh, he's writing into this modern period as well. Uh, and then you know others who are not part of our course, Yates and Joyce and Proust and Mond, those are, are uh, European writers and British writers. Um, Yates will say, no, I'm Irish, as with Joyce, uh, but uh, um, those are different. We have music in the law, Rites of Spring, which caused a huge controversy, a riot, as it says here. Um, uh, Stravinsky wrote the music, and uh, Nijinsky choreographed it. And this presentation uh, caused all sorts of you know, 
literally was not um, presented again in Paris until about 50 years later. Um, if you take my humanities course, I covered this uh, rise spring and the impact it had uh, uh, as, as such. And uh, you know, when music started playing, for instance, I'll give you a little, little point here. When music first started playing, the audience wasn't sure if it was just the orchestra tuning itself up to start or if the music had actually started, because that's how the music sounded. Uh, and then the dance choreography for the rise spring didn't match anything that anybody had ever seen. Uh, and they protested that. They literally stormed the stage. And there's an apocryphal story that Stravinsky, who was in the um, uh, back of the theater, had to escape out a, a window from a bathroom. He probably didn't have to. He probably went out of that door. But he literally had to flee the theater because uh, uh, the threat to his life was such. So you have some details like this. So again, um, uh, it's, a, it's a really promising idea and views that we see, though, because things are changing. Um, and you have uh, Marianne Moore and Wallace Stevens and Langston Hughes, just brilliant writers of, of his time. Uh, Lowell and H.D., as they were mentioned up here, um, Ezra Pound, and of course, William Carlos Williams. Um, they mentioned Edna St. Vincent Millay writing in his time. And so it's just a strong period, and there's Edna St. Vincent Millay uh, mentioned again. Just, this is just a wonderful time of writing. Uh, it really is. Um, you have the expatriates. Saw that a little bit with Henry James and Daisy Miller. Uh, well, that continues where Americans leave and go to Europe uh, and get caught up in that uh, scene and abuse and bring back ideas. Uh, it says here um, about many of them that uh, Hemingway and Fitzgerald uh, going across into to abroad and living there. Robert Frost, in case you uh, didn't know, Robert Frost did not find success in America early in his career. Um, he published a collection of poetry that basically what we would now say tanked. Um, didn't do well at all. He went over to England, uh, worked there for a little bit, and his work was published there uh, and was received very well critically. So that when he came back to America, uh, that's when his fame in America started because he had found a critical applause in England and if the English were behind it, well, hey, he's an American, and we, we're all for him. And that's what really set off his career. Um, and so you have some issues. You have some wonderful working. Uh, Hart Crane producing The Brig. Patterson by Williams, uh, uh, just a brilliant work. Uh, lengthy poem. Um, Patterson, of course, Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, in case you're wondering what that references. Um, but you have others, uh, Ryan. They, they've mentioned Claude McKay several times. He was a leading figure in the, in the Harlem Renaissance. But you have others who are writing and get novels. The American novelist really takes um, a forward step in the early part of the 20th century. Um, they just they were really good before. I mean, there's nothing against Mark Twain, uh, Stephen Crane, Henry James, the ones I actually read. You know, The Awakening is a really strong novel uh, by... Um, Kate Chopin, but American novelists really start surging forward, rising to the, the top of all writers uh, from any nation. Um, they really start working well, and they are starting to be cited for that. The poets start being more and more heralded. I said Robert Frost is heralded in England for his work, um, and you have others who start rising. And much of that actually stems from the late 19th century, when the French discovered Edgar Allan Poe. Um, Poe had been sort of, when he died in 1849, had been sort of a well-regarded critic, but not regarded that much for his uh, uh, poetry and his short stories. Uh, the French find him, if you will, uh, in the 60s and 70s, 1860s and 70s, and herald his work and just praise it. The English uh, critics catch on to that too, saying, well, yes, because he was educated in England. Uh, and the result is that by 1880s and 90s, Edgar Allan Poe's work started being reassessed. And the view is, if he's writing, what about other writers who are Americans? And so their work started being seen again and again and again and being reviewed, and American writers start surging in popularity and critical 
popularity. So we start seeing these depicted in that way. Um, again, a uh, number of just uh, really strong lives in this era. Uh, and so again, women um, move forward. H.D. Hilda Dooley, known as H.D. and Amy Lowell, strong with imagism. Uh, strong with imagism uh, that uh, Ezra Pound helped to foster, and that was embraced by numbers such as William Carlos Williams. Uh, Gertrude Stein and Marianne Moore, Willa Cather, very much more in regionalism, lying like about her Nebraska area. Uh, uh, Zora Neale Hurston and, and Larson with the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, Catherine Ann Porter, uh, you know, just some really strong short stories. Uh, wrote a novel, okay, but her short stories are just excellent. Uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay, beautiful in writing about, about poetry. Um, when I was in seventh grade, Edna St. Vincent Millay was my favorite poet. Um, I've added to that sense, she's not in the, in the top. She's not at the top anymore. But I, her works are just really strong and good work. And make a number of comments about, as it says here, social, sexual liberation, about women and women's roles. And they're just really good. Um, you have others uh, who also work. In, you start having screenwriting. Uh, we don't have that much in our book. But many of these authors that uh, I've been mentioning, like Fitzgerald, Faulkner, Hemingway, their works are being turned into plays and into movies. Uh, and um, what's really wonderful is that William Faulkner actually went to Hollywood as a screenwriter because he couldn't get his own stuff for really making a living. So he went out and did screenwriting. And if you go and look at some of the movies uh, from the 30s and 40s, you'll see some of these really prominent authors that we know actually were screenwriting. Um, there's a, 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 a movie called to, Hope, to Have and Have Not. Uh, it's based on a short work by Hemingway. Um, so I was Humphrey Bogart, Catherine, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Lauren Bacall. Um, and uh, it, it's a wonderful work. Um, and um, the screenplay was written by Faulkner based on a short story by Ernest Hemingway. I mean, what can be better? Um, and so you have a number of different areas along those lines, too, as a, the theater is important. Um, you have uh, Eugene O'Neill writing plays for the theater. You have uh, a number of others writing. Uh, and they give you about Hellman and Sherwood and George Kaufman and Moss Hart, sort of really coming along with the, the social comedy um, that they do. You have others, Elmer Rice, excellent. Cliff O'Gets, uh plays are, are really strong. O'Neill especially strong. You have some members of the Hall of Rins on writing plays. Um, you have uh, uh, others coming along. Um, you know, just you know, works that, that, that are really outstanding, as I said. Um, and this gives you a little timeline of when these are coming along. In a station metro, a two line poem by Ezra Pound because it captures that image uh, coming along. Uh, Home Burial by Robert Frost, one of his longest poems. Um, it is uh, essentially a dialogue and it doesn't really match up with what we might anticipate as typical of uh, Frost, where the rhythm and line is really formed and set. This one doesn't follow that. Uh, so you have the, the timelines here that when the works are done, what's taking place in the world. Um, and you see uh, the different works offered here. Um, you know, this is just to say a, a beautiful little poem by, by Williams that Supposedly, was a note that he wrote and left in, the, in his ice box. Uh, he came down the next morning asking his wife what happened. Where was it? Where was it? She went and watched the note. The one, she goes, Where? It's over here. Why? She goes, It's he, he, she asked him. He goes, It's a poem. Uh, and it's like, okay. Uh, but you have others uh, coming along. Uh, John Dos Passos' USA trilogy, um, a major work, extensive work, building upon what had been done by uh, some of the European authors. Such as Proust with his uh, uh, his works um, and uh, in uh, commentaries that are often again you see the details that are presented here. Um, Edgar Lee Masters, one of the ones you were asked to look at, was uh, well known and well uh, um, critically received writer. His Spoon River Anthology is his most well known work, where he literally goes in and does poetry based upon people looking at the the, um, the headstones, if you will, 
and giving those people. So it's a, the comments from the dead, if you will. Very strong words. I'm going to go down here a little bit. Uh, there, you have a text here that is part of it. Um, where again, the, the goddess, and they're not very long words, but all of them are about as the ones looking back at it and looking at us after they have died. And, and then Butch Welby, and again, this is about as long as I get. Uh, you know, after I got religion and saved, they gave me a job at Kenningwood. Every morning I had to fill a tank in the yard with gasoline. It goes on. Talking about uh, one morning I stood, as I stood to the pouring, the air grew still and seemed to heave, and I shot up as the tank exploded. And down I came with both legs broken, my eyes burned crisp as a couple of eggs. Uh, so I let the blow fire go, and it wouldn't just fall. The circuit judge said whoever did it was a fellow servant of mine, so old road son didn't have to pay me. And I said, I'm going to stand. Why is Jack still the same over and over? He didn't know him at all. So I did that, what happened to him? Uh, being blinded by an accident that the employer didn't have to pay him, did not have to compensate him. Um, and so you start seeing these social comments being made in the poems uh, in just sort of uh, a simple way. And again, um, uh, this idea about when I ran the needle in my hand while watching the baby came down from Lockjaw, uh, you know, it talks about the, the views and ideas and how uh, uh, offer and being have refused. E.A. Robinson was the most heralded American poet, most uh, critically well received and, uh, and awarded uh, poet uh, up until Robert Frost. Um, Robinson does a wonderful job with his work. Uh, we have uh, Richard Corey here, and you can see the details about his life, and I'm not going to go into those, but Richard Corey's work, and Luke Havergal's that one, but Richard Corey's the one that you have a question about on your, uh, and so Richard Corey, and they have some details here about it. Well, Richard Corey uh, uh, is, of course, uh, uh, an allusion. Uh, you're supposed to make the connection to Richard the Lionhearted, uh, Richard Le Cour de Lyon, uh, Richard the uh, First, and you have this very simple poem that's presented in 16 lines. Uh, where you, when you get to the end of the poem, there's that that switch, that ironic aspect. And this is what Robinson does quite often. He builds it and gives you the little, little switch, little connection. Uh, and he works really well where he phrases it. Sold a crown, yet crown, yet imperially. You have uh, richer than a king. All these, of course, help us to make the connection, recognize the illusion. Uh, excuse me, things keep popping up. The connection to the illusion to Richard the Lionheart. Um, and so you have have the, this wonderful presentation where the narrator is a collective, we the people uh, of the town who see him and wish we were in his place. And the contrast between uh, Richard Corey, who is a gentleman, clean favored, quietly arrayed, fluttering pulses, schooled in every grace, and finally we thought that he was everything. So on we worked and waited for the light, went without the meeting, curse the bread. Richard Corey, one calm summer night. That was the contract. It's a calm summer night. It's not as if this is something bad or anything. It's a calm summer night. Richard Corey, one calm summer night. Went home into the bullet, he said. And so, again, the contract between what the people in the pavement, as they're called, ones who are working class, uh, who struggle, uh, what they go through, and then what this elite, the Richard Corey figure, what he has. Um, but we see the difference. It's a we as a collective, while Richard Corey is always presented as a solo, uh, an isolated figure, um, one who is in solitary. Um, he's always looked at, not talked with. He would say good morning, but again, there's no conversation between the people and Richard Corey. Um, he is only the one who is to be viewed, not interacted with. Uh, and so, you know, quite a bit of, it's really just a, a, a nicely handled work. And that's just typical of, of, of um, E.A. Robinson and what he does. And then for Chidi, again, side for what was not, dreamed about what he wanted to be, the idea about the romantic views of Camelot, 
of the uh, of the connection to the uh, epics of ancient Greece, the wardrobe dance. The, it's all about the, the Medici. You see this, of course, in the uh, the, the Medici family in in Florence in the 1500s and what they did and how life was and the fostering of the arts which the Medici were patrons of. Cesare Medici was born too late. Um, so he thought and thought and thought and thought about it. Um, he talked and talked and faith kept on drinking and he became this impression of, of a man who felt he should have been in a different world, a different time, but doesn't really do much. He never tries to act, never tries to, to, to produce anything, so he dreams and dreams and thinks and thinks and thinks. But he scratched his head and kept on thinking. That's all he does, um, except for drinking. Um, and, you know, this creates this impression of an individual who, who doesn't feel he fits in, but never tries to find a place for him. Never tries to act upon it. Instead, he just thinks and drinks. Uh, again, uh, Robinson is just a really strong poet, offering a commentary about. About the world the changing of the times, but also about the failure of people to do anything, to try to move beyond what might be perceived as limits and do something else. And it's a really strong aspect here that we see. Um, again, when you go back to your, you know, I'm going to go back to the module. When you go back, you'll see those are some of the authors that you were asked to be looking at. Um, but I'm going to go down to the module. Um, again, we have uh, uh, the different ones. And this is for uh, the week. And so you have the overview. This is from the author where they give you the background. And I just sort of hit all those when I went through uh, those parts there with, with you. Um, and then uh, so I sort of summarize those. And you have some ideas also about connections, key points to think about and look at. And then the next part that I have for you is a video over Robert Frost. Um, when you click on it, it'll ask you to log in. I've already logged in. Uh, and it just walks you through this video talking about his poetry, some of the major works and the details and what he did um, and how it, how it was. So again, a video that um, gives you quite a bit about, about Frost in that way. I also have this one about T.S. Eliot. Again, uh, it's a video uh, talking about his work, his life, uh, his details, and major works about it that you can look at and listen to. Um, that gives you those additional details. And then I have for you the next part here is about Wallace Stevens. Um, just a wonderful, wonderful poet. Uh, and again, they offer comments uh, that. Uh, as part of it, that really is a strong view and attitude there uh, for him. And then I have one more here. Yeah, William Carlos Williams. And for some reason, the link, let me see if I can get this to work again. Um, I had it fixed at one time, but we'll see if that seems to have just uh, uh, been hit in some way. Yeah, now it's working. Again, these are all videos uh, from the Annenberg Learner, the Voices and Visions. Uh, that they did, uh, that uh, go through and look at these authors and offer you some comments. They really are nice. This one is a little different. This is not from um, from Voices and Visions, uh, but this is a, a commentary about McKay uh, that is uh, again um, offered in your. In, it's an article that talks about a particular work. Um, likewise, I have the other one here. Uh, that's uh, an article about McKay's life and his background, and it also gives you some critical uh, remarks about his work as well. Uh, I put McKay in there because he's one of those that uh, is mentioned in your book excessively in details there. This was about Amy Lowell, uh, or by Amy Lowell, excuse me, about uh, Carl Sandburg. And then I have some other videos about uh, T.S. Eliot, and also this one is about modern poetry. Um, as it says here, this is Ezra Pound's comment about what he thought should be done, and then they look at particular uh, authors and, and how they do. This is again um, from uh, Annenberg, 
uh, but they do a number of very brief little comments about different ones that you can see uh, coming up into a little more contemporary views. So again, it's a nice little little, uh, little remarks over them about what modernism is and what it can be. This is the uh, lecture series from Yale. Um, and uh, in this one, you have imagism discussed, uh, focusing on Ezra Pound. Uh, this one is about um, Hilda Doolittle HD. This one going back over sort of view of uh, imagism, looking at particular poems by uh, Hilda Doolittle. Uh, in a station of the metro, um, again, it's this chapter five, uh, and he spends quite a bit of time talking about imagism, pound, his influence, and then uh, about the poem itself. Um, and so you, I have several of these for you to look at here, uh, which is why I've not done uh, uh, videos of them. These work just as well, maybe better than I could have done, uh, leading up to your uh, uh, study questions, which we're going to look at very quickly. Um, that you should be working on. Uh, oops, excuse me. Uh, I'm trying to get this in, I clicked on the wrong one. Um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, uh, you have some views about, about the pre Civil War and his work. Um, Build a Fire by, by London. Uh, this goes back into chat, uh, into volume C. And it talks a little about this one. Uh, nature of being the antagonist, again, in that story of the young man at the gold rush time. Um, Determined to go off and find a new new strike and get out there, although uh, the older individuals warn him about the condition, the storm coming in, and he thinks he'll get away with it. Well, he doesn't. Um, you know, he's, he's found later frozen to death. Um, and then it asks you through to talk about how the man looks at him, what he's doing, and his comments, and then but the dog, because uh, he has his dog with him. And in case you haven't. Finish the story, which it should have. Um, the dog survives, the man does not. I just was going over the Edgar Lee Matches for you. Uh, and so you get to look at, there's only a few of the Spoon River Anthology, but you get the details here and ask you to look at two of them to discuss those. Talk about Richard Corey for you uh, and how the key details that will help to emphasize that idea. Um, A. Robinson, I talked a little bit more about this one, uh, about the Richard Corey and the contrast between the people on the pavement uh, and Richard Corey himself and how that works to show us the views. Uh, Member Cheevy is going back to Spoon River Anthology. Uh, no, excuse me. Uh, E.A. Robinson, I talked a little bit about that one. And again, is it comic? Is it tragic? And the views there that how it's presented. Um, and then you have, of course, Amy Lowell, uh, Catherine Goddess. And again, let me get this down here for you. Uh, for some reason that's not working. Going back to the Yale Lecture Series, you'll see that there's a commentary about Hilda Doolittle here, uh, and looking at her, her poetry, and that one gives some details about um, captured goddess view and figure. Uh, and again, in your textbook, it also, let me get to that one again, we'll get to HD. Uh, skipping down here, there she is. I really like HD. And when you get to her opening here, it gives you some comments uh, about her work and who she does and her understanding about that captured goddess figure. Um, and again, it talks about her image poetry uh, and views there that we have. Um, again, looking at, at her work, that you have uh, the views and the concepts of of the view of what the captured goddess is. Uh, again, going back to this uh, and the study questions. Um, and so you have those views in the September 1918. Um, it is a, a, a poem. You know, let me get over here to this one for you. Um, call this one up for you. And you see it here, and there's the poem. Um, again, um, let me close that out. You'll see that this one um, is not that long of a work, but when you go 
back here. Let me see if I can get that to jump back. And you'll see that it's in a collection here with Amy Lowell. I didn't specify that one. It's actually Amy Lowell uh, in that particular uh, uh, selection of poems. And again, it talks a little bit about her background here and gives you some details about her work, what she tried to do and how she used those. Um, and again, when you look at uh, uh, September 1918, um, it talks about the contrast. Someday there will be no war. Remember, these are these are uh, writers who are in between. They've seen World War One, uh, as it is now called, and you have the lead up to uh, what will become World War Two. Um, so she's looking in 1919, right? This World War One has ended, but the impact of that war still there, still feeling it, still recognizing it thinking about what the war had done and how the war was. And so she writes in 1918 just as the war is getting near the end. It's post in 1919, um, but you have that aspect of working with it. Um, and so again, uh, a work that uh, uh, presents quite a bit for you in looking at that one. And I ask you to look specifically at line 9 and 18. Uh, that would be, someday there will be no war. And then the broken world. And keep that in mind what I was talking about earlier about the people coming out of World War I and what they seen, what they felt. And that's when modernism takes off and uh, the comments are made in that, that uh, particular part. Again, um, about uh, a war that left the world shattered in so many ways and, and people questioning, trying to, to understand what and why. Um, the expatriates, one's going off and and trying to find themselves. So that Gertrude Stein looked at that group of writers, those those people, and called them a lost generation. And then you're asking to look for new heaven from old and contrast that one again. If I get this to adjust, um, you have uh, her words there. Uh, and so again, I think actually new heaven for old. Let me get this one right here. That may be one that I had added into your reading list. Um, I'll have to look, make sure, because I think that's what I did. So anyway, um, that may be how with the captured dots. It may be a, a poem that I was supposed to, and I thought I had to add it up here for you guys, but I added some that were not in the book. They, they took some things out with the newer edition. They changed that. So let me check very quick, because I think captured goddess may be gone. Yeah, it, they took that one out. So um, that was one I'll have. To, I'll give you the link to the poem because I've probably already done so. Uh, and same thing with uh, the the poem by uh, New New Heaven for Old. I'll, I'll make sure that gets up in there for you to work on. They don't take that long to read, but they're really good in that one. Um, Captain Dodds is uh, one of those that's really nicely handled, where she looks at the idea about the woman and the struggles that they have and how they're you know, supposed to be revered figures, but they're trapped in what they do, so again, it's part of it. So again, uh, you should be working on these, uh, uh, going through the readings, um, and hopefully, uh, again, the, the extra uh, videos I have for you will be beneficial for you to look at and, uh, as we're getting ready to talk about our second essay, and I'll have a, a video posted about that one soon as well. So again, I'm going to end this one. I'll get this posted as quickly as I can. And uh, again, um, the next video will post during spring break, but you won't have to go concern uh, matters that happen after spring break. So I thought I'd post in case during spring break you have time. All right, I will uh, get that post this post as quickly as I can.